All right. Hey, all of you out there in Eorzea, welcome to She Heals I Tank, your weekly Final Fantasy XIV podcast. Today is Friday, January 1st, and this is episode 245 of the Shit Podcast. I'm your host, Vegan Pete, always by my side, the lovely... You forgot to say 2021 after that January 1st. Oh, did I? <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's kind of an important thing. 2021, we have <laughs> conquered 2020. Congratulations to everyone. And hey, Now it's get Adi. ready for the Savage Tear. Didn't get to say my name. Someone's here with me. Avi, hi. How you doing? <laughs> I'm pretty good, Avi. You ready for uh, 2021 Savage? No. So I thought look. it was I thought it was 2021 ult- Ultimate cuz like 2020 was Savage and so 2021's no. going to be Ultimate. That's the thing. 2020 was actually normal mode. Oh no. And now we're going on to Savage 2022 no. Ultimate. We're in this for 3 years. Oh god. I don't wanna. It's a brand new year, 2021. Any resolutions out there, either Final Fantasy fourteen wise or creator wise or just personal ones? Obviously, so that's open to you as well. Uh, if any of you have anything you want to share, put them in chat. Uh, show wise, for me, I definitely want to work on getting more guests on the show. Uh, I like interviewing people, and from what we have done so far, uh, I want to do more of them. I'm really excited about that. Uh, in game, I want to beat Savage of this tier and then go back and beat the last floor of the previous tier since we didn't. And personal resolution, I need to lose this uh, COVID-15 pounds I've been carrying around for a bit. Uh, really sucks because last year I had just gotten into the routine of going to the gym like a few times and then COVID hit and then yeah, I couldn't go anywhere that unless it was like a necessity. Um, so those are my little resolutions for the year. Have you thought of any yet, Avi? Um, I actually don't generally make resolutions. It's not really a, a thing I do. Um, but I've already kind of talked about some plans that I have with, you know, I, I, the YouTube project got kind of delayed because I spent an entire, got like 18 hour day, it felt like, uh, and I had every technical and uh, other issue known to man that could possibly happen. And so we uh, ordered like bought a camera and uh, got some other stuff set up so I can try to do that. So I'm really excited to kind of start working on that. So in conjunction with that, I've been trying to put more effort into the house. I hung some magnetic knife racks today and our uh, cast iron skillets are going to get hung on the wall this weekend. So right now stuff is drying. Um, Good stuff. But yeah, I just, I actually, I don't know that it's, so much a new year's resolution but i really i feel like i just with 2020 and the whole like staying home thing i feel like i sat way too much and i just want to try to move more like i need to be more yeah. get active get active like even just walking more just get out of the house and off your booty so ace kaneki has a goal want to beat their first savage tier i think that's definitely obtainable and Chili says the goal for the next year is to have more guests on Moogle Go Round like Pete and also have us reach 700 followers. Both of those very obtainable goals. But thank you for wanting more guests like me and not more guests like Avi. I'm amazing. Look at that shot fired by Chili. Ah, uh, not. <laughs> I love Chili. Uh, as always, I like to thank all of our amazing subs out there. Subs since last show, first time subs from Bow Mage, Cyrax, The Red, 321 TV. Two months, we have B Steiner 1979 and B Hempster. At four months, we have Trey Lands Gaming. Five months, Paul Metal Mace. Seven months, Ian Show. Eight months, Al Shalant. 10 months, Kitsune Claire, 14 months, Disco Cub, 18 months, Jessa, Jessa, and 36 months, Aja30. And some of those may have been courtesy of the amazing Bat Kid, who has been gifting some subs to us. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Now for the show today, we're going to be br- ripping off that spoiler tag. We are going to do spoilers for the MSQ for patch 5.4. So you have been warned when we get to the discussion, that's where the spoilers are going to be. Uh, Normally, we would take calls during a spoiler show, but unfortunately, we're having some technical difficulties. So uh, get your thoughts together, and hopefully you'll be able to call in next time. 
And because of those technical difficulties, no sound effects either. Some of you may love that. Some of you may hate that. I'm kind of um, on the fence. Icarus says their goal is to double their gill by next year, get that medium house in Final Fantasy fourteen, sitting at thirty million now, so sixty million is the goal or house, whichever happens. Hmm. All right, Avi. Let's get to everyone's favorite segment. Greenleaf Minute. I feel like I've been talking a lot already, and uh, you should take this. I was noticing that. I was like, I kept trying to kind of like interject and come in, and I was like, man, Pete's just like rearing and ready to go with this podcast. I'm like, you, I, he's forgetting to breathe. I would have you do the Green Leaf Minute, but I don't think you would know what you're talking about. I <laughs> since, mean, it's kind of funny. Since I, I wrote it. But it, oh, you want to try it? I can try it. Go ahead. This I, is Avi. Wait, did you do the sound effect? I did. Can Can you do it again? I didn't hear it. No. Green Leaf Minute. <laughs> Uh, all right, go take it away, Avi. Because you guys all know that I am like the expert fisher, and fishing is like my favorite thing to do in Final Fantasy fourteen. So to totally know that I completely and utterly know what I'm talking about right now. So this don't don't ad lib. Just read it how I wrote it. <laughs> this particular tip is going to hopefully help you preserve some of your fishing bait. And you may be thinking that bait is so cheap, so who cares? Well, sometimes you need something that bites of. Bait, what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you told me to read it as it is, and then I can't. That bites of bait that is bought with gathering white scripts. Some, can sometimes add. you need types of bait that is bought with white gathering scripts. Oh. Figure it out. Abby. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> he fixes, he goes, he just fixed the typo after I, yeah. Should we do that in advance, Pete? Oh, my God. All right. Um. And in addition to saving you bait, it's also going to save you time. This will not work with every fish, but at least when you know how it works, you may be able to apply it to the fishing spot you're at. This tip works great for fishing for blue crabs, which is the main ingredient needed for chili crab. Hey, chili crab! Which is the latest crafting food that all the crafters will be using, which I'm a master crafter, so that's also something that's all, that I that's knew. That's all you've been using? Yeah, I totally knew about that. The best food to use to catch these is squid strip, which is five white scripts a piece, which can add up quick. Just a strip of squid? Like what? Squid strip? Yeah. Okay. I'd rather just buy a whole squid and cut the thing up myself. But anyways, so what I noticed catching these is that they would never bite after 10 seconds. So I wrote a macro that would automatically <laughs> reel in after 10 seconds. That way, you get to cast with the same piece of bait, and you don't waste the bait on a fish that you don't actually need. So the macro was just action, cast, wait 10 seconds, then action, hook, which reels in. There's actually air quotes, so I'm doing finger quotes to go with the quotes around the words. Well, that's the actual name of the action. I know, but there's quotes, and I'm making sure they understand that there were quotes around these words. Good I job. I'm trying to read this exactly like you wrote it. You do still want to pay attention, though, because if you get a bite, you'll probably want to use double hook so that you can get two blue crabs. That gets you two crabs off of one piece of bait. If you catch one on a normal hook and then use identical cast for a second one, you'll save 50 GP, but you'll be using two pieces of bait instead of one. My God, you guys. But... If you're in a place that has more fish biting early, maybe you do want to wait to make sure you can catch the one you need and then use identical cast. Where I was for that blue crab, it was pretty much always blue crab if there was a bite before that 10 seconds. It really saves a lot of time not reeling in all the fish you don't need to. Because, you know, fishing is all about saving time. So you get more of the fish you want and less bait and it saves you time. And this is something I was able to sell for a decent amount of gill, often at the beginning of the patch, for like fifteen to 20000 per crab. Really awesome to be a did master you, fisher. Did you make a lot of money during that, Avi? So much, you guys. Like, I have to say, if I could hit you with the applause claps uh, sound effect right now, I would. Good job. <laughs> uh, started sounding a little bit sarcastic at the end, <laughs> I gotta say. Uh, but overall, very good job. And thank you, Father Fenway, for that sub. And oh. to uh, Spookatron with the bits. Thank you both 
so much. Really I actually was having it. fun doing the like sarcastic try and talk like I know what to talk about. I because I was literally like trying not to laugh because I had no idea. Like I knew they were abilities because I understand that much, but I don't. And you told me to like read it exactly, so I had to yeah. act like I knew what I was saying. Except for that typo in the beginning, I think I wrote that pretty well. <laughs> Chili just said he'd pay real money for Avi to do this as a series. <laughs> It was pretty funny. Abby reads stuff she has no idea about. Nope. And just reads it as written. All right, Abby. Now's your chance to do the sound effect for Tweet of the Week. Tweet of the Week. You can do it a little louder. I don't think that came through. Nope. Tweet of the Week. Ooh, you want to add a little throwing up thing at the end of that? No, I can do that on my own. Thank you. <laughs> this week's tweet of the week comes from Disco Cub, who wrote, who tweeted, So, I was just re-listening to your most recent She Heals I Tank podcast episode. I had forgotten that Reen was planning some festival during the Eden storyline. You know, that was 100% Norvrant's first Pride Festival. Damn right. And I think that was awesome. I love that one. Thank you, Disco Cub, for the tweet of the week. Now it's time for news and notes from around the realm. And Yoshida took to the lodestone at midnight for a New Year's New Year's greeting message. He made a point to say that COVID-19 has been an ongoing struggle, but they have been working to keep everyone safe and they are committed to developing and running Final Fantasy XIV to the best of their abilities. He also gave special mention to all the healthcare workers out there on the front lines of COVID-19. He's received messages from some of them saying how important Final Fantasy XIV is to them to have a place to escape to and see friends when they're not at the hospital. Uh, he says those messages are both heartfelt and heartbreaking and wanted to be sure that they all know how grateful he is for all the hard work they are doing out there. And for the non-COVID part of the message, he writes, quote, the saga of Shadowbringers concluded in patch 5.3 and hinted at the next story to come. Ah, but of course we had patch 5.4, which then flipped the page to the final chapter in the tale of this star. Keep a close eye on the team's progress this year as events build once more to a thrilling and unexpected ending. And then in parentheses, to the story, not Final Fantasy XIV itself. God, I can't, can't worry people that much. Still gonna go on. Um, I don't know if patch 5.4 or 5.5 is really going to be the ending of like this. I think uh, we'll get to that in the MSQ, I suppose. Uh, he also shared a poem that was written by a resolute man that read, Our progeny may never know, wherefore we look into the sky, nor why we dig for truths below. We bear their scorn or watch them die. Was that your resolute man voice? <clears throat> Sorry, I mine did not come out. did not think I changed voices. You did not. That's <laughs> okay. a, that was my joke. Good joke, Avi. He then continues, While we could ponder the meaning of this verse and make a few guesses, the upcoming Final Fantasy XIV announcement showcase planned for February might help us make more sense out of it. As the day draws near and we make our preparations, I'm excited as anyone to see what this event has in store. That was my Yoshida voice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I was actually, I, I actually realized I hadn't read the poem yet. And so I was really surprised that you didn't want to talk about it before the show and, and try to like break it out and figure out what it meant. Like I, my, I just was kind of. Uh, did you think of anything when I read it? Um, so it's obviously. We looked at the sky before, uh, and you know, like, well, no. So basically, what I mean is, as like, we've we've gone to the sky, we've gone to the ground. So we bear their scorn or watch them die. So that's I think that's like the main. But it's our progeny. So isn't our progeny like our children? Yeah, I may never know where, why we looked on the sky, nor or why we dug in, went in the ground for truth. We bear their scorn or watch them die. So the children are either gonna like be bitter toward us. And we have to leave it that way or let them die. I don't know if they're talking about us per se, um, because we well, don't no, I'm just, have any kids. I know I'm talking with the pronouns that are here that are. I know, but you have to think who this resolute man is. Is he someone who went to war? Uh, I know. I, I just kind of got I was a literally, war. Just literally direct translating the 
the poem right now. That this is why I would have liked to have talked to you about this before the podcast. I want your real reaction to it. No, because then you'd like and mine. Uh, so yeah, I don't really know who that resolute man is. Chili thinks maybe the Alligans. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's us though, because we don't have any progeny. The, the Alligans make sense. Asians, F U K K. Emma says, "Hand waving, time travel. We can go back in time and save something, uh, one, and have them hate us or let them die." I don't know. Well, then you know the answer is going to be they're they're going to hate us because we never really let people die. Um, but I mean that could be um more of the gratia, perhaps. Uh, yeah, they they could make this fit in a myriad of different ways and just be like, "Yeah, hey, that's what we said." Yeah. So we'll see. So there were also uh, some new optional items that have been added to the online store. So now you can pick up some of last year's Heaven's Turn items. Shocker. I bet you guys didn't expect that one. Uh, so they've got the authentic Heaven's Turn bounty housing item for $5. The Crimson Nezumi Kabuto for 3 And the Cobalt Nezumi Kabuto for 3 Which are hats you can't wear if you're a bunny or a Rothgar. So meh. So you're not going to get them? Oh, you already have them. I already have them. <laughs> I always get these rewards and i never use them past the event yeah. ever i i don't think the the headpieces look that good to begin with and then they don't really fit with anything no it's it's a very specific i still do the event though i still get them right like, like you though i never wear them no put them in the put them in the glamour dress not the glamour dresser the armoire and be done with it <laughs> kk did you really want to wear these hats no no i did not speaking of heaven's turn did you know that the event started yesterday so now that it's already started, you're going to have until Monday, January 18th at 6.59 a.m. Pacific I'm Standard Time, I'm assuming, in order to complete it. The subtitle for this year's Heaven's Turn is Celebrating an Extraordinary New Year. Get it? That is because 2021 is the year of the ox. Shocker. Uh, you can start this by heading to the upper decks of Limsa Lominsa at the Aft Castle and talking to Ushi Bugio to receive the quest Steering Clear of Trouble. You do not need to be level 15 to get the quest. Well, that's new. Oh, you, you do. do. You do. I was like, you don't. That's new. Um, from completing the event, you'll be able to get, shocker again, a Crimson Ushi Kabuto, a Black Ushi Kabuto, and... A handmade akabuko, which is a tabletop housing item with a small and large ox. So Chili's saying that means the next patch is prob probably January 19th. So when they end the Heavens yep. turn event, maybe we'll be getting patch 5.45. And then all you crafters out there can go for that title again. Lucky Suckers. you. So fun. Uh, the patch 5.4 special site has been updated with a few more pieces of artwork. Uh, it seems to be for the bosses of the Eden Raid that weren't in the trailer, so you can go ahead and check those out if you're a fan of the artwork. Mm. There's a new callback campaign going on right now, and will, will last until January 13th. Uh, the way this campaign works is that if you uh, that you can select an online friend friend from your in-game friends list or free company member list, and then select invite friend to return from the sub command menu. This will only apply to people that have been inactive for at least 90 days, and they must have already have purchased and registered Final Fantasy 14 to their service account. Mm. Uh, if you invite someone back that meets those requirements, they will get an email with the name of the character used to send the invitation and the world that, on which they reside, so you know which friend really wanted you back. <laughs> um, if they decide to return from that email, they will get seven days free play, 99 Aetherite tickets, and 10 silver chocobo feathers that can be traded to the Calamity Salvager for gear. And if a player has already previously come back from one of these campaigns, they won't get those rewards again. Mm. But you can still send an email and say, hey, I miss you. Uh, if someone returns that you invited back, uh, then you will get five gold chocobo feathers that can be turned into the Calamity Salvager for rewards. Uh, the best of the rewards is definitely the Twintania mount, but that will cost you 15 gold feathers. Uh, there's also a couple other mounts you can get, the Amber Drop Chocobo Whistle and the Manogram Horn. Each is eight gold feathers. So I do think it would be fun to, like, if you your FC, say, had somebody who has left and hasn't logged in and... You just wanted to spam that particular person to get them to come back if everybody it went to the subcommand? It only sends it for the first person that did it. Oh, really? 
Oh, well, that's that's me. Yeah, so you got to be the first to do it if you if you it, want a chance. I figured it would send an email every time, but then like the only the person who would get the feathers would be the one who like the email they clicked. That was yeah. Me. That's how I interpreted that. Well, that's less. Fun. Uh, so you 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 would need three people to come back to get the fifteen gold feathers for the Twintania. Right. But those are the same gold feathers that you get from the refer friend program. Right. So you can mix and match. However, invite your friends. All right, Avi, did you have a teaching Pete lore so he'll learn some shit? I do. Of course I do. So this question... No it, sound effects, sorry. ...is originally from episode 197, and I made the question, so you got it wrong. Uh, what? <laughs> You're reusing a question? I haven't reused a question in like four episodes. This is the start of 2021, and you couldn't even come up with a real question? I made a question last episode. Don't be a dick. <laughs> Jeez. All right, jerk. Why were the grand companies originally formed? A, after the last calamity, the realm was overrun with new adventurers and needed an organization to help guide them. B, to guard the Eorzean city-state's supply of crystals from the bre beast tribes of the region, in turn preventing them from summoning their gods. C, to protect the Eorzean city-states because of the realm's ether was imbalanced toward water and an imminent flood. Or D, to protect the Eorzean city-states from Garlean attacks. I forgot to mute Shit. my phone. Three of those sound like they are legitimate ones. I'm good like that. Uh, uh, why don't you make me a new question? I know, I'd have better chance at getting a new question than an old one. What? I don't, that th makes no sense. What episode was this from? 197. That's so many episodes ago. Like a year ago. Oh my God. Um, shoot, I was thinking crystals from the Beast Tribes, but it could be the Garleans. See, the interesting thing is with this one, I actually remembered it because of the question I asked. Like, it's, I don't know. But... Which one did I guess last time? Uh, I don't keep record of that. I keep record of what the correct answer is. You'd have to go back and listen to episode 197 to I know. know. Maybe I did think crystals last time. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm thinking crystals this time because crystals was the answer. Um, the original, why they were formed, why the original grand companies were formed. <laughs> KK says, pause the podcast real quick. Go listen to the episode. Do you think we uh, were fighting the Beast Tribes or the Garleans first? I would think Beast Tribes, right? Yeah. It's an assumption, but yeah, I would think Beast Tribes. Um, I'm just going to go with the Beast Tribes and Crystals. I actually think that is what you answered last time. Damn it. <laughs> the answer is actually... And you're going to laugh again. And you hated me last time. Is it the water one? It's the water one. Son of a bitch. That's such a dumb answer. <laughs> to protect the Eorzean city-states because the realm's aether was imbalanced toward water and an imminent flood. Which actually is kind of interesting because on the first, the realm's aether was balanced toward light. which And then there was a flood, which not because of the imbalance, but see where they took that from? I can't believe that. Da, da, da. I thought it was a good question to ask again. Oh, I hated it. It's because you dumb. Just kidding, you're not dumb. I wish I had the ding sound effect. Ding. All right, Avi, let's get into main scenario quest, main story quest discussion. Uh, you don't usually like when I do a long recap of the MSQ. Yeah, because I feel like if somebody wants a long recap of the MSQ, they'll just go watch a YouTube video of somebody who actually ran it. What? Yeah. Are you saying I'm incapable of doing a long, accurate review? That's not saying you are incapable. I'm just saying, like, I don't think a podcast is the right place for that. I think it puts me to sleep every time you do it. Oh, I think and it I, is. I actually feel bad for our listeners. <laughs> like, I would, <laughs> I don't would wanna, turn this podcast off. If they off. don't want to listen, they can fast forward. Yeah, but That's I can't. That's the great thing about a podcast. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck. So, uh, Avi wanted me to do a quick, Summary. concise. This is still longish. Summary. Which, which a quick, concise summary for Pete is two pages. Double spaced. No, it's not fully double spaced. It's like, no. <laughs> All right. So 
I'll read, and then if you want to start reading, if one of these paragraphs you really like, you can go ahead, take it over. I'll... Oh, I'll, I'll be able to judge based off the first two words whether or not I like the paragraph. While you're reading another one, while I cannot listen to you to try to decide which one I'll, I'll like. I have no idea what you just said, but <laughs> let's go ahead and do it. We start out in Mordana, and Lee shows up to remind us that she still exists and to serve as a plot device to recap what happened in the first for those, those of us that weren't paying attention. She then leaves because she forgot she had a meeting to go to. Dumb bitch. Thancred and Urian J play private eyes together and fuck off to Garlemald to see what's happening with the Garly in Game of Thrones. Slow down a little bit. I can't even keep up with you. <laughs> Shit. Ourselves and Alice are going to go on a romantic quest of untempering. And then third wheel Graha Tiaj freaking invites himself along and Alphano does nothing because he's Alphano. Our lead for the Intempering is in Oz's Law. Luckily, Tataro went and pimped my ride and got us a brand new airship. Ooh. Thankfully, Third Wheel Graha invited himself along and is still touched by an Allegan so he can get us through security. That's right. You all need that friend. We find an orb that has a recording that might help us, but it's locked behind a password. Mm -hmm. Alice pulls an Alphano and guesses password is the password and gets verbally bitch slapped by the node. We decide we need Sid to hack into it. We go and meet Sid, but we're confused like a baby whose father just shaved for the first time ever. What the fuck happened to Sid's voice? It, it was butchered my boy. It was hard to concentrate on anything after hearing his new mismatchy voice. But Sid, Biggs, and Wedge end up with a sonic screwdriver, I mean Magitech terminal, and are able to get the password that is America, I mean freedom. We unlock that Allegan orb and get a hologram from someone named Owen, who is trying to solve how to cure tempering, but Big Daddy Zandy told him to knock that shit off and get a real job. We don't really learn much from this, but we come up with a plan to wake up their aether and restore memories at the same time. We don't really know how to do this, though, but luckily we have this orb that can run a bunch of simulations to help us find the solution. Damn. It's too slow on its own, though, which means we need to boost the power. Turn it up to 11. So Sid orders Wedge to gather up all those sonic screwdrivers, I mean Magitech terminals, in the kingdom. Wait, am I reading the wrong spot? Nope. <laughs> you wrote that twice. All right. We hook all of them up together. Shit's about to blow, but luckily the answer pops up on the monitor, like, immediately at the right time so that third wheel Grahatia can see it and memorize it immediately. Now we need to find someone to experiment on, so we head to Limsa Laminsa and find our little test subject, Gabu. Oh, he's so cute. Alice, sum Alice summons a porksy, the extraordinary Angelo, mm -hmm. and Third Wheel imbues Angelo with the magic to do the memory transference. They take Gabu to the laboratory because you want privacy in case it all goes tits up. That's smart. Then an exhausted Alice staggers back to us, and shortly behind her is the adorable little Gabu, who can now talk again. He's cured. We have a success. But Alice and Angelo can't do this all on their own for all of Eorzea. They need an army of porksies in order to untemper the beast tribes of Eorzea. So we head to the real Matoya's cave because she's the best there's ever been. Uh, she tells us that she will help us, but first we need to clean her workshop and take a pottery class. And in some real Mr. Miyagi shit, the work we did gave us the tools we need for our quest. Matoya works her magic on our clay porksy, and a mother porksy is made that we need to beat into submission after we show it who's boss. Yushtola imbues it and creates three more magic porksies. That's kind of fucked up if you think about it. We had to break the mama porksy. We made you just to beat you. Uh, no, we like like a horse. I had to break her, and then like then we breed her. Go. Uh, we head back to Limsa and find out that some pirate fuck doesn't want to cure the tempering because they're getting all rich by taking all the kobolds' crystals. That's when Merlweb, the badass bitch on our side, brings out Annihilator and Death Penalty to spray some lead. Captain Hilfer, Hilfer gives a nice speech and you know, he's pretty badass and then we're off to cure the kobolds. We cure the kobold patriarch and we're like, are we good now? And he's like, nah, mate, you stole all our land. Uh, you went back on your word. You're a bunch of cunts. Uh, Meryl Webb is a gangster, though, and throws him her death penalty gun and says, pull the trigger if you don't trust me, bitch. He's like, nah, I don't trust you, but you fucking scare me. Here's your gun. Let's play it by ear. 
So then we're about to head back, and then this red shirt comes to alert us that there's this big old thing that's going on in the floating city, and we get there, and it's a gigantic tower. Merle Webb starts a group chat and finds out the others have seen towers all over Eorzea. We head to the locks to meet up with Lise when all of a sudden a brand new Bahamut is attacking the palace. We meet them at the top of the royal menagerie, and who's riding new, ma- new Bahamut but Kefka, I mean Fan Daniel. He went to make Eorzea great again and recreate the final days. He wants to kill everyone, even himself. And now that Elidibus isn't holding him back, he's gonna try. Turns out it's Lunar Bahamut. And they use a mega flare to knock us down and burn some flowers. Van Daniel's parting words is basically, Zeno wants to 1v1 you, come get him. Oh, and he started a band called the, the Telephory, come check them out before the world ends. The Lunar Bahamut. <laughs> Uh, back in Mordona, Yishtol is even like, dude, guys, this is getting really boring and repetitive. Like, seriously. And we all nodded in agreement. She's also given some porksies to to Nanamo, and now we like, shocker, those towers are popping up everywhere. Since we're dealing with a dragon, too, we're like, oh, no, there's a dragon, which means we need to get Alphano's boy Astinian out here. And Alphano's like, oh, but he, we can't find him. And like, bitch, that's just because you suck. Freaking Kryle and Totoro like, we got this. Sit your ass down. Meanwhile, uh, in the locks, a resistance scout is stumbling back to camp, mumbling all zombie like, glory be, glory be. Over and over with glowing eyes and starts running towards Lise to attack, shouting, glory be to Garlemald. Meanwhile, in the Imperial Palace, Cut to Zeno's board, just lounging on his throne, while Fan Daniel just all teleports in, and then they recap everything we already saw, and then Zeno's just like, whatever, bitch, I just want to fight the Warrior of Light, and Fan Daniel just wants to die and take everyone with him, and then Zeno's tries to act all hard by stepping on his sword, the end. And that is the most accurate summary of the msq you're ever going to hear honestly it's my most favorite summary of the msq we've ever done (laughs) thank you esper eidolon for that sub thank you thank you thank you um all right avi so yay or nay did you like not like i like the first half of it i liked it until base like we were done with the kobolds wait well i liked it it was the and Merwib, that whole thing. When do, when when do we don't get Alice? I liked it right up until we the dungeon essentially. Kind of, well, it was right after the dungeon. So we did the Cobalt Patriarch, and that was really cool. And then Merwib went all gangster, and that was really cool. But then it was like as soon as we head back to the locks, and we and we see yeah. Lise, and then the Lunar shows up. I was just ugh, ugh, ugh. I think it's safe to say we're both kind of tired of the Asians. Yeah. Um, so what I liked about this was we saw some old friends. We saw Lise, Meryl Wibb. Uh, Lise was more of a plot device for the story, uh, catching off. people up. Oh my God. As soon as we saw Lise, I was sexually really mad because she was like, I heard sexually really mad. Okay. Uh, she, she goes, hi, I'm Lise. In case you forgot who I am, I am now part of the, <laughs> like, the resistance in Alamigo. Like, are you fucking kidding me? You think your viewers are so dumb we don't remember Lise? Come on. Come on. Like, okay. don't dumb it down for me. Everyone heard sexually really mad. So Lise makes you hot and bothered. You hear what you want to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, Lise was uh, just a plot device to recap the story for people. Meryl Webb actually had shit to do. She's cool. She's always been badass. Like, Meryl Webb's, Meryl Webb's badass bitch. I like her. And that's something I've been asking for for a while, is, like, returning to see some of these past characters, the three city leaders specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for me, Meryl Webb was definitely the MVP of the patch. Yeah. I think she's amazing. Uh, that's why I've always wanted more stories with her beyond just meeting in her quarters every so often and telling us something. Uh, they actually gave her story and something to do. When and she kind of stood up like a couple of times, she was like, I was a pirate, bitches. Yeah. Like, you forget that. You forget that I started as a pirate and I earned this position. Let me throw a little bit of this pirate ass at you. Yeah. <laughs> like, and was she cool. was a real damn leader, too. Yeah. And I loved it. Like, like being willing to die essentially to for the greater good of Limsa Luminsa. Like you knew that he wasn't gonna shoot her, but like just to be willing to do that for your your country. Well they both shot. 
No, 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 not against the pirate, against the oh, kobold. kobold. Yeah, that dude was a little bitch. <laughs> yeah, that, nah, he was stupid. I hated his facial expressions so much. Like I appreciate that they're playing with the facial expressions, but he was like, "I'm just looking at you all squinty-eyed because I'm menacing. I'm like a freaking teenager who's just like angsty." I didn't really like his character, but I did like that they were at least <laughs> trying to present a world where everything just isn't fine. Yeah. Like there is some strife within the city because it was built by fucking pirates. So pirates are going to want a pirate, but his character in general just wasn't great. Um, we also saw Nero for the first time in a long time. Uh, he help needs it, a new outfit. Helping out Sid, but I thought that part was probably the weakest of... The, that first part that we liked. Did anybody else have issues with Sid's new voice? Because oh, I think we all did. I re- yeah, <laughs> well, I didn't see anybody in chat like comment when we got to that point, and and I oh, I just it almost like took away the chemistry between him and Nero. Like the previous voice actors just had this like natural chemistry, so it allowed you to kind of ship that. This guy, I don't. It just didn't. It took me out of the story. I'm like, yeah. no, nope, no. Nope. I wasn't. I wasn't a fan of it. But I really think Nero needs a new outfit. I think he's been around long enough to like. Get him some new new. I think Lise dates. probably wants a new outfit too. I, I think everyone wants Lise's outfit. Lise had multiple outfits. What are you talking about? Did she? Yes. She's had like three. The, this is a new one from last time we saw her? No, she was Yida and then she was uh, in the Lise red outfit. Then she went to back like a Yida Lise mixture outfit. Now she's back to like the red outfit because that's her like iconic one. Sid doesn't speak often, but I know his voice well enough that it was a jarring change for me. It was just wrong. It was not... Like, usually when they, they switch voice actors, it's not so different from the voice that was used before, I guess. I don't know. I didn't like it. Didn't like it. Another thing I liked was reusing old zones. That's another thing I've harped on before. Uh, give us a reason to revisit some of the old zones. Uh, I had mostly been thinking that maybe they give us more entertaining side quests in those old zones, but mm. this works too. I honestly thought that first part of the MSQ felt more like a side quest. Like something that us and Alice are kind of doing our own little side quest together. Right. Um, like going to go kill all the bats. Who can kill them faster? Yeah. Um, and I like that it was a very human story for the most part. It was about figuring out how to help people, how to live together with people that have been your enemies, like the Beast Tribes. Uh, it had nuance with the piracy thing being a part of what Limsa was founded on, but not part of the future. So I like that a lot. And I'm really interested what the role of the beast tribe is going to be in the future once i'm assuming we untemper them all i feel like the the point of taking away the summoning and the tempering is is to create more of an equality because they they basically like in eorzea you know there's the well and yancha wherever there's beast men like it's like they are they're they have like god my brain is something of the words they can talk they can create and craft. They're living beings, but they're thought of as less than the rest of the world, which is kind of old way of thinking and not very 2021. When you when you brought up Yancha, were you saying it's not quite that way in Yancha? No, or? it's there. I mean, they have the 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 wolf beast tribes that they also treat the same way. That the, all the beast tribes are treated as less than. I would say I think, but it's because they blame it on the fact that it's because they get tempered and they can summon these primals. So if you take that away. Will there finally be equality? I feel like that's more of an Eorzean thing, though. The ones that are tempered, like, uh, I don't think the wolf tribe was tempered. The Ananta. Uh, were they? Yeah. Do not Oh, yeah, the, I remember. Yeah. Well, um, okay, but I guess in, because the Namazu. Are... So Chile says the dwarves, they get to visit the town and sell stuff, but they're also kind of treated horribly, like, like, oh, just take your mask off. Like, why don't you take your mask off? Like, it's not respect that that's their culture. Like, the the Mikote and the Elizin and, you know, every everyone else within that is, there's a respect there. Where if it's a beast tribe, it's, and the dwarves are, are slightly less than that, but that's because they're Lalafell's chili with masks on. As they're, but they're treated the same as Lala's. <laughs> no, they're not. They're actually treated worse than Lalafell's. Uh, they're not beastmen, they're Mandalorians. <laughs> uh, and Emma's actually says the the problem with this cure quest line, and I agree, it, it felt really contrived. Like, everything we need, we suddenly just happen to have it, or we get lucky, and it's just magically yeah. there. Like, so much felt like that, and it felt like lazy writing to me. That's why I said that whole part with Sid and Nero 
was the weakest part of that first yeah. part of the story. Are you fucking kidding me? He sees he like like if you're randomly going through generated code to try to find the password, like Grahatia being like, "Wait, we're almost there." Like you literally would have no idea because it's random. So like his saying that was just ridiculous. Yeah. And then it like happening to happen right before they blew up the system and then he happens to memorize it as well. It was just too much. It was too much. Like if it was a side quest and it was just like us and Alice like going to figure yeah. this out. Yeah. And you had more time to like really flesh out what we needed. I think you could come up with a little more scientific, so, you know, a, a Orzean scientific rather than way. Rather to cover so much in like short order, why don't you just cover less and do it well? Like, you don't need to go through all of those steps to get there. Just do less steps and then have it actually make sense. Like, I would have liked us finding a tome with the password for the node better than finding a yeah. Magitech terminal yeah. for Sid to become a hacker. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was not. I, I did not enjoy it. That was, like, I say the first half was good, like, except for, like, that bit. That bit was just stupid. It was really stupid. And another dislike for me on this was obviously the Asians. It's been like 10 years and Asians are still the main protagonists. I really just don't care about them anymore. They're boring to me. It's They're bad stretching them out way too long. Well, it's like, like you're enjoying the story and, and like the Eden story. We're kind of talking about this. And then as soon as an Asian shows up, you're like, God dang. Like, and you just check out. Yeah. You, I, I did. I was like, ugh, Okay. So I picked Merweb as my MVP, and for my LVP, my least valuable player, uh, it has to be Fan Daniel for me. He's so boring. You didn't pick Alphano. I'm shocked. I mean, <laughs> he 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 barely got in the game. Yeah. So uh, whether it's Kefka, the Joker, Loki, Thanos, I've seen some variation of this villain so many times, mm. and. It, like I said, it's just boring to me. And while I thought that Emic Selk had some like Johnny Depp as Jack Sparrow mannerisms yeah, to definitely. him, uh, they turned Fan Daniel up to 11 on those to a point where it was annoying to me. Well, it's like a sequel, like a sequel where they had less of a budget and they're just like trying to reach those same numbers, but they're not actually like doing it well. <laughs> and then the other issue I actually had was I also, so Xenos, they went through all this effort for Xenos to come back to life, to fight to get to his own body, to like to just work to get to where he is. And then his only desire is the same desire he only had before all of that is to fight us. Like that that's zero character development in in a lot of time. Yeah. And I was I was mad about that. And then I actually the whole time kept thinking about Pete's joke of like like he lost his virginity to the warrior of light essentially and and he's just like obsessed with getting that again or like it just felt very weirdly obsessive in that like sort of way but i don't know and i just i don't i, I don't understand <clears throat> why xenos is even here if it's just rehashing the exact same thing we've already done but with a different weapon because he broke his weapon so it's gonna be different guys because the and weapon's different my thing with Xenos is, motherfucker, we beat you. You come to me. I'm easy to find. Yeah. If you want a rematch, you know where to find me. Yeah. Like I'm not hard to find. I already whooped you once. I'll whoop you again. Come find me, bitch. Mm -hmm. Like We're the champion. You're the challenger. You yeah. find us. Don't make us come to you. Right. Like, who does that? You're not... Uh, and then he threatens... They threaten to send the Lunar Bahamut out to burn the cities and stuff. It's like, well, why don't we just kill it now? It's right there. Like, let me just fight the freaking Bahamut and then we kill it. And then, eh. Yeah, so MS just says we have it in another dimension for a while, but that feels like a, an excuse. Like, it's just lazy. It's just lazy. But also, we've established that the amount of time that we were over there, what it felt like to us is much smaller on the source. Uh, like, we haven't been gone for that long. Right. Um, And... Regardless, he knows we're here now. Come get us. Mm -hmm. um, McCloud says Zeno's going to get a Warhammer, which will be the weapon of the Geomancer. I don't know about that. I mean, if they're making such a big deal about him, like breaking his sword and getting a new weapon, they better make it something like significant like that. Like that would be the only way like I'm OK with that. Like <laughs> Emma just said Geomancer's getting a bell, bro. I would love to see Zeno fight us with a bell. That'd be funny. Bong. I'm going to bong the hell out of your head. Um, They're just going to give him, like, a really long Sephiroth sword. Yeah, I just, 
I feel like he's just going to end up with a different sword. And it's just like like them trying to say that Fan Daniels and Asian, who's different because he's not unsundered and he doesn't really care about Zodiac and he's super unhinged. But like for a villain's motivation to be, I want to die and I want all of you to die and I want it to be painful for you is, again, lazy writing. There's no nuance at all to it. None of that. Like he's a bad guy because he's crazy. Okay. Whatever. I just, well, what am oh, I supposed to do with it's that? It's just so hard after how great Sha- the story for Shadowbringers was for it to go like this lazy. I like looking at Zeno's chili. He said I like, but like his character hasn't grown at all. He hasn't changed at all. He died a bunch of times, fought to get back to his body for what? To to relive what he di- you know previously died doing. Like why? And if he really wanted to do it, he could just do it. <laughs> like I said, find us. Mm. We're not hiding. You're the one sitting on your chair bored as shit. Come get us. So MS is saying Fan Daniel's a clown. He's acting. What he's presenting is all not at all what his real plan is. I can get that because everything he's been saying is acting like the world is a stage and he's putting on a performance and everything he's saying is that, but it doesn't mean I enjoy it. Like it's it's either going to be, oh, shocker, he was doing something else or, oh, boring, this is what he's doing. I just, it's not been presented well in my opinion. I... I seriously did not enjoy it. I just really was disappointed. Yeah, uh, if they can do a good surprise, uh, I'm I'm all for that. Yeah. As of right now, if they I, can redeem I'm not this, seeing it. Cool. I so far none of this feels new. None of this feels fresh. And the bits that did feel fresh and kind of fun were like surrounded by, oh hey, look what we just did. It just happened to be right there. Yeah. Like, oh, uh, I don't know. But yeah. Anyways. Like, if Xenos wanted to fight us, he could have just come with Fan Daniel on top of the royal menagerie, and we could have had round two right there. Do it right there. Why is there got to be a big old... Because he likes foreplay, Pete. Um, so, yeah. another. Uh, we already talked about Sid not liking his new voice actor. Sorry, bro. Um, not that you did a bad job. It just wasn't our Sid. Right. Um, and... The only other thing I had was the way we got some answers. Yeah. The hacking from Sid, how we figured out the memory transference solution. I'm not totally sold on how we even do stuff with the Porksies. Uh, <laughs> it, it just works, whatever. It's like, well, what are what are Nanamo going to use to imbue all the Porksies with? Did Yishtola do that before she left? Like, what's going on? I'm not 100%. Probably the most interesting villain Um. That of this was the um, Alamegan scout who was zombified to come in and like attack Lise. So because it wasn't quite a tempering, it was like, you know, because in a tempering, they just kind of like all they can think about is summoning and then, you know, working with that primal. But this guy was like given a task. Um, I feel like that's going to be definitely tied. I think it's going to be tied to the towers. Um, yeah. But the towers also... Wasn't that like they're like a sci-fi show where an alien invasion did that with the towers already? Like I feel like that also has been done. So um, I'm hoping that it feels fresh with however they're going to use these towers. So I think the towers are causing that sort of tempering. Um, but he said, "Glory be to Garlemald." So it's like almost like Garlemald. The, 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 the towers were were put there by the Garlemalds. Yeah, but it's like they're somehow. Being like a fake primal, kind of like they have. But it's not going to be a tempering. That's the whole reason that we're like the the we're untempering these people. Is such a big deal is because now we're going to be fighting these guys who are mind controlled. But it's not a tempering. So it's like we have this great solution, but it doesn't help us for the current problem. Uh, we will see. Oh, Chili is saying he thinks we're going to use the towers to untemper everyone in the world at the same time. Uh, that'd be cool if we could use those towers. Do a little over. But then, what's the point of all the porksies? Uh, now we don't need all the porksies. We got towers. We're gonna with... skewer a porksie on, te- on top of each of the towers, and then like have a barbecue. There's and gonna then... be Boo! one large porksie culling. I guess I don't know. Barbecue porksie for all of Aorzia. Sorry, we're not super like enthusiastic about this patch. If you guys really, really loved it, we are trying to talk about the bits we loved, the bits we didn't. I but... mean, I-, I liked most of it. I just. I liked a what, third of we, it, I'd what, say. Once we got back to uh, the palace uh, in the locks, I'm like, then I just started rolling my eyes. I thought I liked more of it until we started talking about this, and I was like, wait, I didn't like that bit. I didn't I, like that I, bit. I think it's just because it's easier to rip on stuff you didn't like than to keep on praising the stuff that you did like. Cause well, you're just I, like I think I liked about a good third of it. I don't think I, I was as, oh, as I, much as you. I enjoyed the vast majority of it. Uh, especially when you consider that the dungeon was part of the MSQ. I liked that. I thought that was really cool. 
Uh, and we talked about that last week, just not in so many uh, details. Um, MS says, theory going around is the towers are designed to stir fears and summon them as creatures, emulating the way the Amarid teams fell. Okay, so was that kind of like the creation magic stuff? Yes. Sorry, I was like, what, what, huh? The way you said Amorid teens is what, like, I st my Am brain stuck. Amorations? Yeah, <laughs> like, that's, I would, my brain just got stuck on that for a moment. Um, and then also, uh, so he, he mentions Telephori, like, we we're supposed to know what that is. I don't, Pete, did you Google that, look that up at all? No, uh, I think I did when it first came up and I didn't find anything. Okay. Um... Yeah, I think it's just a, a little name drop for us to know that something's coming. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I Google there ain't Jack Diddley. Um, so my question is, what do you think Xenos and Fan Daniel, how, how long are they for this mortal plane? Uh, are we taking care of them in 5.5? Or are they going to be the main protagonist, at least for part of 6.0. I hope not, but the way they're leading it up, they usually do have the one, the one, the protagonist we end with usually starts the next expansion at least a little bit. Um, hopefully, if Xenos only wants to fight us again, I don't think it's exciting for Xenos to suddenly get stronger and yeah. then have that be something that continues into 6.0. So if any of them were to die, I would hope it would be Xenos. Even though I like, I enjoy his character, but he hasn't had enough growth for my t taste. And if Van Daniel can become more interesting and less one-dimensional, then I can see that continuing on. Because I feel like those Garlean Towers in that situation, that's Van Daniel, because Xenos doesn't care how yeah. he gets there. But yeah, so I think it was Emmis who said it's all an act from Fan Daniel, mm -hmm. or they think it's all an act from Fan Daniel. It makes sense because he talks it, about the stage all the time. Yeah, but it's also like, okay, then what is your plan? Uh, is that what the question is going to be heading into 6.0? I don't know if that's a good cliffhanger. I don't to... know if he's a strong enough. Well, he, he may, magically, they might realize, oh, we're presenting him in a way that it's pissing everybody off. Let's present him differently in, you know, uh, 5.45. I don't know. But, um, yeah. I'm hoping they wrap it up, and I think they can wrap it up in a little, like, longer-than-usual patch. So Icarus is saying that Xenos is going the route of Yushtola, that he can't die because he's a poster child of the game. Why is he a poster child of the game? Uh, I think he's in a couple different games now. Oh, damn it. I didn't realize no, that. No, they'll get rid I think he's gone. I he don't. Not if he's in other games. Yeah, Square Enix likes their money. Gone. It's all a fan service. This game is a fan service. If they've got a character in other games, he is gonna stick around. Um... Nah, I, I I really think Xenos is done after 5.5. I'll be disappointed if he's one of the main protagonists leading into 6.0. I think you're going to give him more, but I hope he because, goes Because, like you said, there's been no growth of his character. He still wants the same thing. He doesn't care if the world burns. He has no interest in actually leading Garlemald. Uh, Garlemald is a shit show right now. I'd actually love to, like, see more about the Garlemald Game of Thrones, like what happened with the successors and stuff like that. Like how much in turmoil is Garlemald right now? Because I guess that's what the Alliance meeting that uh, Lise was going to, yeah, right? They like, built that up a lot, but they're treating, I feel like they're treating it like they did Alamigo. Like they, they, they bring us this great like turmoil of government system, uh, like not systems, but government organizations and military. And then they go, Oh, and that's just, Quickly fix that and move on to Asians and Primals. Yeah, Chili saying, uh, I have heard Garlemald supposedly is a side story, Pete. Um, I'm okay with it being a side story. Like, I'm all for better side stories. Uh, but you still need to have a good main story. And I don't think the main story with Asians is good anymore. And then Father Fenway says, unpopular opinion, but I like Xenos just because he's a dead inside F at Psycho. I liked Xenos because yeah. he was that. <laughs> we we, we really already, liked Xenos in the beginning. We've already had that. So if we're going to keep Xenos around, then like he's got to, he needs a different agenda. He needs something else that drives him. Like seriously, you guys, he like fought like a motherfucker to get his body back. Like it was this really cool whole ordeal. And then he gets it back and he's like, I want to die again, <laughs> basically. I don't know. But everybody's thinking, yeah, he's going to absorb Zodiac. Zodiac. And Zodiac. Zodiac, sorry. And it's going to, like, that's how 
I, I honestly can see that now that I know he's in Dissidia and just like the history of Square Enix, I don't think he's going anywhere. I think he's going to become like a big, big bad. Yeah. I don't know. His motivation has to change for me to think he's interesting. He's going to instead of just getting his rocks off. He's going to have to change to be like, okay, I want to lead Garlemald. I want to take over the fucking world. He's not going to care about Garlemald. He's going to, if he, if he merges with Zodiac, like Garlemald and shit. He's like, I want to keep the warrior of light as a pet that I just fight every once in a while. I pictured like uh, him as uh, Jabba the Hutt and the warrior of light <laughs> as Princess Leia, Slave Leia, <laughs> which Pete in that green subligar is kind of funny right. for that. Someone draw that. <laughs> a big old Zeno says Jabba the Hutt. And then a, and then a warrior of light, vegan Pete warrior of light <laughs> as Princess Leia. Someone much more talented artistically than I. <laughs> it happens in my brain. I'm sorry, guys. So yeah, anyways, but it's been fun talking about this with you guys. I've been like hearing what other people think and, and honestly, like, cause I don't play Dissidia. So, but hearing that he's there, uh, yeah, he's, he's got that plot armor so thick. He's yeah. I, I thought it was weird because before I had done the MSQ, I had heard a lot of people saying they didn't like it because not that much happened. And when I was going through it, I didn't really agree with that because I really enjoyed the untempering part of it. Mm -hmm. And but then, like, the people who didn't like it liked the last part. And I'm like, well, oh. I, d I didn't like the last part. Yeah, uh, okay. It's just a difference of opinion. You, you, like, a, you can like whatever you like. Yeah, of course. Um, no, you have to like what I tell you to like. Yeah. As long as you're not hurting anyone, I don't care what the fuck no, you do. No, enjoy what you do. Um, <laughs> Icarus says, with all the buns, cat girls, boys around, I'm sure that they're <laughs> that's on the internet somewhere already. Well, if it's not, we need to get on it. <laughs> Uh, did you have anything else to add to the MSQ, Avi? No. Nope. I think we hit most of the big points. Um, I guess the last thing about that alliance meeting that Lise had, they came. They kind of thought like Garlemald wasn't important enough to deal with right now, and we should focus on our domestic problems a la the Beast Tribe. So they made that a conscious decision from that meeting. Mm -hmm. I think. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, should we go ahead and get to uh, the community roundup, partner? Well, you did the intro, so I think so. <laughs> this week, it's a Twitch streamer under the name Leonardy. Twitch.tv slash Leonardy, also on YouTube under the same name. We learned of him through Diana Prince, and I've checked out his stream a few times now, and it's always entertaining. Uh, I've seen him do some savage raiding and whatnot. I think uh, he's really cool, and he also does a show called Who Wants to Be a Gillionaire? Oh, yeah. And as you can guess, it's based off the TV show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I haven't been able to catch that live, but I watched a past broadcast, and it made me want to be there, which I think is a good sign when you're watching. He this. wanted to have us on the show, and I was like, I'm so bad at, like, <laughs> no, I don't want to. I would make a uh, fool of myself. I you will, can go without me. I would gladly make a fool of myself. <laughs> um, but I think it's a good sign that I was able to watch a VOD, and it made me want to be there. It looked like a lot of fun, had great audience interaction, and just like the original who wants to be a millionaire uh you have lifelines you'd be able to ask chat and he had a poll set up so you could ask chat and they Cute. could help you out uh it was a really good time so you can catch uh him both on twitch and on youtube go check them out and uh hit him with a follow and a little bit of listener reaction today we got disco cub who says for me oh i had asked what uh people's favorite accomplishment was in final fantasy 14 in 2020 uh disco cub says for me it was definitely joining the fc making new friends and having a support system during such a difficult year uh alice lufina said catching up with msq leveling my crafters and gatherers and discovering the joy of maps at voxna7 says being around and active for an entire expansion cycle I've never done it before, but I've been here since the January before Shadowbringers this time around. I've since gotten into crafting, became a battle and crafting mentor, leveled all classes, and got the platinum trophy. That was a busy 2020. Yeah. Uh, the Zero You Know says, uh, being with me, I being with my FC, I am. Uh, I got a lot of fun memories with them and managed to get most of my raids and Savage done this year because of them. It looks like uh, just the personal inter interaction with your FC and friends is uh, the big takeaway from 2020. That's part of what got us through 2020. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
So anything else you want to add, Pete? That is it from me. So on that note, that is going to be it for this episode. As always, of course, we've enjoyed hanging out with all of you live here on Twitch. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Be sure to hit that follow button so you know the next time we are going live. And a great big thank you to everyone listening to the podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Wherever you choose to listen, you really are the reason we keep making episodes. And remember, wherever you do listen, it would mean a whole shit ton to us if you gave our little shit podcast a rating or a review. Or more importantly, tell a friend to check us out. Here with Vegan Pete, I'm Avi Ale, and we will see you the week after next. Bye. Goodbye.